So last time I kind of left you hanging on the hypergraphs, didn't I? I've been showing you graphs of nodes and edges, like this one, where each edge connects two nodes, like this. And now I've shown you hypergraphs of nodes and hyperedges, like this one, where each edge connects three nodes, like this. I asked, but didn't answer, some pretty fundamental questions about hypergraphs. Questions like, why would hyperedges connect three nodes? Why not one, or four, or seventeen nodes? OK, I'm not going to leave you hanging a moment longer. Here are some answers. A hyperedge can connect any number of nodes. One, two, three, four, seventeen, or any other number. And a hypergraph can include any of these different kinds of hyperedge, or all of them. Let's take a look at what this means for Wolfram physics, and at some of the beautiful hypergraphs it'll allow us to generate. Let's start with some terminology. Those edges that connect two nodes I'm going to call binary edges. And those hyperedges that connect three nodes I'm going to call ternary edges. From now on I'm going to be using the words edge and hyperedge interchangeably. A binary edge is just a special case of a hyperedge. It's a hyperedge that connects two nodes. And a ternary edge is just another special case of a hyperedge. It's a hyperedge that connects three nodes. You see what I did there? I referred to a ternary edge. Strictly speaking, I should have called it a ternary hyperedge. Instead, I used the word edge. It's less sci fi, but it's shorter. And honestly, who cares? Whether I say edge or hyperedge, you know what I mean. It's a relationship between two nodes or three nodes or any other number of nodes. Let's start with the number 1. If there can be ternary edges involving three nodes and binary edges involving two nodes, then can there be unary edges involving only one node? The numeric notation I introduced last time certainly allows for it. If we can write a ternary edge that involves nodes 1, 2, and 3 as 1, 2, 3 in curly brackets, and we can write a binary edge that involves nodes 1 and 2 as 1, 2 in curly brackets, then we can certainly write a unary edge that involves a single node 1 as 1 in curly brackets. OK, so how would we visualise this? We've been visualising that ternary edge, 1, 2, 3, as two arrows and a transparent white web between three dots for the nodes. And we've been visualising that binary edge, 1, 2, as an arrow between two dots for the nodes. So how do we visualise the unary edge, 1? Well, it's entirely up to us. Remember that the way I've been visualising binary and ternary edges is arbitrary. I've chosen to use dots, arrows and webs, but I might equally have chosen to use crabs, snakes and bats. How we visualise a unary edge is arbitrary too. I'm going to choose to visualise it as a circle around the one node it involves. Sure, it might have been more fun to visualise the node as a crab and the unary edge as a turtle, but let's keep things simple and visualise that unary edge, 1, as a circle around the dot for the node. It has to be said that universes of unary nodes aren't very exciting. Take this rule. To apply the rule, we find a node with a unary edge and create a new node with a new unary edge. No prizes for guessing what happens. If we apply the rule over and over again, it simply creates more and more nodes, each with a unary edge. This is a lonely universe. No node is connected to any other node. That's no surprise, given that a unary edge involves only one node. To connect one node to another, you would need a binary edge. So unary edges can't play a role in a complex connected universe like our own, right? Well, not so fast. Let's try a rule that involves both unary and ternary edges. To apply this rule, we find a node with a unary edge, delete that unary edge, create a new ternary edge from that node to two new nodes, and create unary edges for those two new nodes. Apply this rule over and over, and a branching universe emerges. You can see how the unary edges do play a role in this more complex connected universe. 
The rule will only match a node if it has a unary edge, so those unary edges matter. This hypergraph includes a mix of hyperedges with different arities. It includes both unary edges and ternary edges. Now let's try a rule that involves binary and ternary edges. This is a complex rule, but still I'm going to try to describe it in words. To apply the rule, we find a binary edge from one node, node 1, to another node, node 2, and a ternary edge from that second node, node 2, to two other nodes, nodes 3 and 4. We delete both of those edges. We create two new nodes, nodes 5 and 6. We create two new binary edges from node 5 to node 3 and from node 6 to node 2. And finally, we create two new ternary edges from node 2 to node 1 to node 5 and from node 6 to node 5 to node 4. And that is such a mouthful that you might want to see how this rule can be written using the algebraic notation that I introduced last time. I've included it in the article accompanying this video, and I'll be doing the same for all rules from now on, so if you're algebraically minded, be sure to click on the link to the article in the show notes. Applying this rule over and over, a boxy branching universe emerges. Again, this hypergraph includes a mix of hyperedges with different arities. It includes both binary edges and ternary edges. You can see where I'm going here. To repeat the answers I gave earlier, a hyperedge can connect any number of nodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 17, or any other number. And a hypergraph can include any of these different kinds of hyperedge, or all of them. Anything goes. If an edge that involves one node is called a unary edge, an edge that involves two nodes is called a binary edge, and an edge that involves three nodes is called a ternary edge, what do you call an edge that involves an arbitrary number k nodes? Well, you call it a k-ary edge, of course. You can imagine how we might write a quaternary edge or fourary edge as 1, 2, 3, 4 in curly brackets, and a quinary edge or a fivery edge as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in curly brackets. I'll leave it to your imagination as to what we might use beyond dots, circles, arrows and webs, or crabs, turtles, snakes and bats to visualise these higher arity edges. So now we've generalised Wolfram's hypergraphs to include hyperedges connecting any number of nodes. That's good, right? Well, I'm not so sure. Back when we were simulating Wolfram physics using graphs, we had our work cut out for us determining which rule or rules might be applied to the edges of those graphs to yield our universe. Back in that age of innocence, all those edges were binary edges. Now that we're simulating Wolfram physics using hypergraphs, we really have our work cut out for us determining which rule or rules might be applied to the hyperedges of those hypergraphs to yield our universe. Now, those hyperedges might be unary, binary, ternary, or k where k might be any positive integer. It seems to me that the number of rules we need to explore to find the rule or rules we're looking for just got infinitely bigger. Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast, or YouTube channel at lasttheory.com. After all, this might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.